Sweet. Okay. Uh, so my name is Eric Badger. I'm uh, a software dev engineer uh, on Hadoop on the Hadoop core team at Oath. Um, I work in Oath Champagne. And uh, I've been working there for about a little less than three years now. Um, and I'm going to be talking about moving uh, the Oath grid to Docker. Uh, kind of our strategy for that, why we did it, how we did it, um, how we made it work for us, and uh, the good things that came out of it and some of the challenges uh, that came, came about as well. So first and foremost um, are the motivations. So why is it that we would want to go do something like this? Um, the number one so, uh, thing that we kind of came up with was, well, we really want to get to RHEL 7. So we, we're constantly fighting the battle of uh, Red Hat releases a new a new operating system, um, and we want to get there, but our users really don't like changing anything ever. So uh, they'll, we'll be on RHEL 5 and want to go to RHEL 6, and they'll say, that's great, but we really don't want to move. And we'll be on RHEL 6, want to go to RHEL 7, they'll say, that's great, but uh, I've got seven other things on my quarterly goals that I got to finish first, and going and doing some recertification of this job is not anywhere near the top of that list. Um, so that's something that kind of we, we wanted to, to get past. Uh, another thing that we're kind of lacking is um, some security aspects in Hadoop. So running tasks, um, there's not a whole lot of security um, in Yarn on running tasks with each other. So there's a little bit of, of C grouping, um, and obviously they're running themselves as, as different users. Um, so you have typical Unix permissions. Um, but beyond that, there's not a whole lot of security with tasks running uh, on the same nodes. So that's a potential security problem for anything. And in this day and age where everybody is getting hacked constantly uh, and there are CVEs for every package uh, available and kernels and all that, uh, it's something that we wanted to get a little bit out in front of uh, to give ourselves a better isolation or a better security strategy on what we've got. And then the third one is isolation. So not only do we wanna have security um, between the, the tasks that are running on each node um, and across nodes, but we also want to isolate them from each other just kind of so they, uh, they can't hurt each other. Um, you, were, uh, you heard Darren talking about, you know, jobs where they would just uh, hammer the name node or whatever with uh, different file ops and stuff. Uh, well, they can do the same types of things on the nodes themselves. So if, if a, a job goes rogue and all of a sudden just starts shredding the disks, uh, that, if, that affects the other job that's running on that node. We really don't want that to happen, though. So uh, we'd like to have ourselves a better isolation strategy so that if there's a single job that is doing something nefarious, um, whether that's because they're malicious or whether that's just because they accidentally did something, it's not going to have as much of an effect on uh, whatever else is running there. So these are the kind of things we wanted to get to. Um, however, running arbitrary user supplied docker images on yarn was not at all a motivating factor for us so the whole go to docker hub pull an image that's a web server or does some crazy python thing or whatever and then running that on hadoop that's not something that we want to do um, shane kumpf is going to be giving a talk later in the day that i believe will touch on this a little bit um, and their the strategy for doing exactly this but for our specific use case that was not something that we were looking for um, so just don't want to cross wires or anything here uh, so now let's talk about a little bit about the architecture uh, of what we had and what we're going for. So initially, this is what you have kind of uh, what it looks like to run processes on Hadoop. So this is a single node. You have your single node manager process that's running on the node, and it's on a RHEL 6 host. That's what it is in our case. Uh, and you've got some different packages, libraries, Java, Python, Perl, whatever. All of the Yarn tasks are going to be running in separate processes on the same node alongside the node manager process. That's what we've got right now in RHEL 6. Now, moving to RHEL 7, with our Docker implementation, you have something that looks a little bit different. So you still have the node manager process. Uh, instead of running on a RHEL 6 host, we're now running on a RHEL 7 host. And instead of these yarn tasks running right alongside each other and right alongside the node manager process, now we've got them all running inside of RHEL 6 Docker containers. So the user space is going to look the exact same to these yarn tasks because they're still inside of RHEL 6 Docker containers. So the user space is still going to be looks exactly like RHEL 6. However, they're going to be grouped into their own separate namespaces in the different Docker containers that they're in, providing us a little bit of isolation, a little bit of uh, security along the way, and also providing it so that we have uh, different packaging that we can do. So you have 
Java 102 here, uh, Java 141 here. They could use uh, user local bin Java, the exact same path. So you don't have to change anything from the task, but all of a sudden you get the different version of Java. And you know you can do that for anything. So uh, it makes it a little bit nicer. So security, that was one of the things I touched on of what we really wanted to get out of um, with this move. So we've got a few different things um, that have really helped us get into a better security model. Docker is not known for being the most secure thing that you can do uh, because it, sh it shares a same kernel between all of the processes. So you would think that VMs would be the most secure thing to do. And, and that's very true still. Um, but because of that, we've gone out of our way to make sure that we uh, have extra things that are gonna give us security beyond that. Um, so the first two, or the first three really, are things that are coming from the, the Linux kernel. Um, the seccomp profile is secure computing. Uh, this is gonna be a whitelist of system calls that you can use. Uh, so it just says, I can or I cannot use whatever system calls. Um, Docker themselves, they publish uh, a default seccomp profile that you can use uh, that gives uh, just a listing of all of the system calls that they think are okay to use in the and those go in the whitelist. So I think by default, there's like 40 something system calls um, that are just automatically not in the whitelist that you cannot do once you enter into the Docker container. Um, we use basically the default set count profile with the uh, the omission of uh, we added in the mbind system call. Um, there's some things with NUMA uh, that make it so that we kind of needed that to be able to actually use uh, some of the NUMA stuff in RHEL 7. And then we have the Linux capabilities. This is kind of a different way of touching on that same type of thing. So Linux capabilities, uh, as opposed to just being system calls, uh, the capabilities is kind of like, what kinds of things can you do? Can I elevate my privileges? Can I talk to um, the networking stack? Um, can I, I don't know, stuff like that. Uh, and this is just another Linux construct that says what can and can you not do. Um, by default, Linux or Docker gives you about 10 different capabilities that you can use inside of containers. We, in our internal build, have dropped all of these. So this includes set UID, set GID, um, you know, being able to increase your privilege of, of or the priority of your job, of your processes, anything like that. Um, you are just at a kernel level, no longer allowed to do that inside of the container. And then the next one is the, the no new privileges flag. Uh, this is this is a flag that you set on a process in Linux, um, and this makes it so that anything that is forked and exec from that uh, parent process is going to inherit this no new privileges flag. And so at a kernel level, again, you are not going to be able to inherit any extra privileges unless you found some sort of CVE against the, the kernel itself. Uh, next up, we have uh, the fact that we use read-only containers. So when we actually start up a container, the file system itself, the root file system, we mark as read-only. So you can't write anywhere that is not specifically uh, bind mounted in. And that's a way, bind mounts in Docker are a way for the, the host operating system and inside of the Docker container to kind of talk to each other. It's a, it's a view uh, from the bare metal into the Docker container itself. Since we mark the actual container read only, that means that the only place that you can actually write in this container are these mounts that we specifically allow you to have. That makes it a very confined space and it makes it a space that is controlled specifically by us. So if we, uh, we know exactly the places that you're going to be able to write in this container, uh, and that limits the security attack surface um, that you're actually gonna be able to exploit. And then the last thing is that you enter the container, the Docker container is the user UID GID. Uh, this is necessary for a few reasons, um, but first and foremost, we don't want you entering the container as root. So even though we've dropped capabilities, you have you know, your set comp profile, limiting system calls, no new privileges and all that, uh, if you're root in the container, you're still root outside of the container. The, the concept of root is still the same. Even if you can't really do anything with root, you are still privilege zero, and that's not a great thing. So we enter the container as UID, GID of whatever you are, um, and then we have other things around that to make sure that you can't elevate your privileges afterwards. I talked a little bit about the bind mounts. Uh, the, again, the bind mounts are the things that take you from the host, uh, the bare metal into the container. Uh, and this is the list of all of the bind mounts that we have in our containers. So you can see this is a list of six things. 
Uh, that's a pretty confined space. It's not like we've got millions of different things, right? So you have the Hadoop release. That's just kind of like, I need to get access to my Hadoop jars, my comps, and whatever. Um, that's stuff that's necessary. After that, you have your distributed cache stuff. That's just, I need to be able to run my job, right? These are just Hadoop constructs. So those are the read-only ones. And then the more interesting ones are the ones that are read-write, because as I said, the containers are read-only by default. The interesting stuff is where you can actually write, because writing is where the, uh, the exciting stuff happens. So um, first and foremost, we've got the NSCD socket. This is something that's not uh, necessary, I guess you would say, um, but we utilize it because um, it's really helpful for user uh, using the host cache. So by, uh, by mounting in the socket, we're absolutely actually able to use the host socket, uh, sorry, the host cache to do the user lookups. So that means that every time we start up a container um, and we do a user lookup on whatever UID, GID you are, we're not gonna have to hit the LDAP server every single time. We're gonna actually be able to use uh, NSCD, which is the namespace caching daemon, um, to keep these, uh, these mappings cached, which is really key because otherwise the LDAP server is just gonna fall down, Darren's gonna yell at me. Um, uh, next, we've got the HDFS uh, short circuit socket. This is, this is just another socket that you need um, so that you get around some of the extra latency um, behind uh, reading from HDFS when you have data that's co-located with the task that's actually running. Then you've got the container log directories. This is where we need to be able to actually write stuff uh, so we can see what happens later. Um, and this is uh, necessary that the node manager can actually see what's happening. If you just write this inside of the container, um, but the node manager doesn't have permissions or it, uh, it's fleeting and it, it goes away with the container, um, then we're not gonna be able to see it afterwards and we're not gonna be able to use it for node manager aggregation, um, uh, log aggregation. In the future, we could use something like Docker volumes to actually uh, get past this so that we could get rid of this bind mount altogether. Um, but for the meanwhile, uh, this is what we have. And then the last one is, well, the tasks actually have to write stuff sometimes that's important, right? They need temporary space. They need to be able to write out stuff um, so that you give them a little bit of temporary space. We give them temp, we give them var temp, um, but these aren't actually temp and var temp on the host or on the bare metal. These are slash temp and slash var temp in the container, which is actually mapped to part of the application specific working directories on the host, uh, which is really nice because I don't know if you guys have ever had this, but if you have jobs that just write to slash temp or slash var temp or whatever slash temp, you can't really clean that up. You don't know at the end of the life cycle of the job, there's no way of knowing, oh, they're done with this or whatever, right? Well, if it's in the container, you just say, okay, you write into this container, you, uh, but we're actually writing it into the working directory of the job. So that means when the job is finished, we know when to clean it up. It's not just some nebulous thing in slash temp. So that's, it's really nice for not running out of disk space and crashing your nodes. Okay, so that's all about the architecture. It's a thousand foot view of how we've done it. Uh, but I think the really important thing is how do we actually get here? Because if there's no usable strategy of going from point A to point B, then I really don't care how great point B is because I can't actually take the hit of going through that process. Um, so we had a few requirements that made it so that we could go from point A to point B. And we said, you know, we're not going to even go through this process unless we can get X requirements. And this requirements are this. So we want no cluster downtime. We had rolling upgrades um, that, that came out a few years ago and our users really, really like that, that we don't have to say, hey, the cluster is going down for six hours while we do this upgrade. So we said, yeah, we need to continue to do that. Uh, we need no changes to current jobs. As I was talking about earlier with the rel six to rel seven migration or rel five to six, if users have to do anything, you are getting yourself at least a year's work. That nothing's gonna happen for at least a year if, if you have any sort of sizable user base, uh, just because they've got other things that they need to do and they really don't care what you want to do. They care about making their money and changing their jobs and doing whatever, right? Um, so we wanna take it completely out of their hands. And then we wanted to make sure there's no more than a 5% performance degradation. Um, we know that Docker is going to have some sort of overhead because we're putting it in a container that has to, you, know, you have to start it up, you have to run with the Docker daemon. Um, it, there's, there's just inherent overhead there. Um, but we wanted to make sure that the performance wasn't that bad um, so that it was going to really affect our jobs. So how we did this uh, is actually something that's pretty simple. Uh, it's really, really not that genius at all. 
Um, it's the node-specific runtime or the node-specific Linux container runtime as we have it uh, internally. And what this does is it chooses the runtime based on the node that you're running. Uh, so if you're running a RHEL 6 container, you're going to be running with the Linux container runtime. If you're running a RHEL 7 node, then you're going to automatically get the Docker Linux container runtime. Um, so that's going to be based on purely on the RHEL version of the node that that task gets scheduled to. Uh, Craig Condit actually has a patch that's uh, similar to this, all, um, similar to the work that I've done internally for this on Yarn 6456. So if you're interested, uh, you can take a look at that. That's pretty close to actually getting merged into trunk. Uh, the interesting part thing here is that if you have Docker and Linux based on Node, that means that your jobs themselves could have this Frankenstein structure where part of your job is running on RHEL 6, and part of your job is running on RHEL 7. So some of it's gonna be on bare metal and some of it's gonna be in Docker containers. And for the most part, this is fine. Um, but if there are any problems with running on RHEL 7, you're gonna run into problems that are going to be slow. Uh, you're not gonna find them because uh, with task uh, retries and uh, stuff like that, you're going to be able to hide those errors away. So you'll have five task failures because you ran on a RHEL 7 node, but then they just retried themselves and you didn't really see it. We had a little bit of that um, when we were doing some upgrades, uh, but it's just something to look out for. And then this is user transparent. So I said, I don't want the users to have to change anything. Um, so this is completely from the node manager's point of view. The user doesn't even know that this is happening. We specifically say that this is the runtime that you're using, has nothing to do with the actual job itself. No configs from their perspective. Um, another part, uh, part of Docker is that you have to have Docker images. Uh, the Docker image is basically just the, the root file system of, of what you get in the container. This is what we, uh, we mark as read only. Uh, really, it's just um, it's an overlay file system of a bunch of stuff um, that, that is used uh, to start up the container. It's just a file system, right? Uh, instead of trying to have the nodes pull the images as needed, um, we decided to preload the images onto the nodes. So this is, uh, we actually use Chef, and Chef goes around and at some different interval, um, on smart intervals, it's gonna go and uh, load the images onto the nodes. The reason that we do it this way is for two, uh, to avoid two problems. One of them is the thundering herd problem. So we had a little bit of scalability issues with our Docker registry internally, uh, Docker registry being the thing that hosts all of the images um, and allows you to, to pull them down. Uh, if, if we have all nodes on a cluster or all clusters trying to hit this thing at once, that registry is gonna fall over, um, just like the KMS and Darren's talk earlier. Um, there's some scalability issues there, and so that's just a, it's just a big problem. So instead, we spread that load out over a period of time so that instead of the entire cluster hitting it at once, you have maybe the cluster divided by 100. So a few orders of magnitude. And the other one is, uh, the other problem is to avoid task timeouts. If you don't have the node or the image already preloaded on the node, when you go to run the job, the task is gonna start, it's gonna call up a Docker run. It's gonna say, here's the image that I wanna run with. The node's gonna say, hey, I don't have that image. I'm gonna go to the registry and I'm gonna get that image. But that image is four gigabytes or two gigabytes or 10 or whatever. Uh, that takes some time to actually download. And if that takes long enough, then that's actually going to hit a task timeout. And before you even able to start up your task, that task is already timed out uh, and you failed that task. And that's a really bad thing. So now the first time that you have to load, that you run um, that image on any node, you're going to basically get a task timeout or you're going to get significantly uh, bad task um, runtime on that node. So um, for our internal implementation, we force jobs to use a specific Docker image. Um, again, with the, we don't want the users to specify anything, change anything. We say, uh, when you are on a RHEL 7 node, you run with Docker and you run with this specific Docker image. Um, that allows us to say, uh, you know, we know exactly what they're running. It confines the security space again because we know what's in that image. We have made that image ourselves uh, and we know uh, and can control all of the packages in there. So if there's a CVE in one of the packages in that image, we are the ones that get to control, oh, we need to go update that image really quickly, um, and we can uh, then deploy that at our, at our leisure as opposed to 
uh, telling the users, oh, hey, there's something in your distributed cache that is super out of date and we need you to update that. And they say, okay, cool, we'll get to it in like four quarters from now. Uh, however, there is some times that we actually want the users to be able to do something um, uh, to get their own set of features that aren't necessarily uh, in the set that is going to be useful to everybody. And so what we have for that is we allow them to pick um, if they don't want to use the default, they can pick from a small set of other images. So for right now, what we have is the RHEL 6 image, we have the RHEL 7 image, um, and then we're also working on uh, another image that we can use for, you know, some machine learning, TensorFlow stuff. Um, maybe we'll also add one that's like Spark related, um, something like that, just giving them other options of different types of libraries uh, that they can use uh, if they would like to. Uh, and the challenges of moving here. So we've kind of gone over what the architecture looks like, um, how it is that we're going to move there, um, but nothing ever works as planned. If it did, that'd be too good to be true. So here we are with what, what actually went wrong. Um, this is a very small list and I could probably talk for at least 15 minutes on each one of these bullet points. I won't, because I like you guys too much, uh, but I could. So the first one is uh, system call overhead uh, due to set comp. So the set comp profile is great because it whitelists all of the system calls that you actually want to use. Uh, but the problem is there is a pretty bad overhead um, in the current uh, RHEL 7 Linux, or sorry, the RHEL 7 Linux kernel um, that is used. So that overhead due to set comp is about, uh, yeah, um, is about 8x overhead on getting in and out of the system calls. So that is if you are purely system call like really really system call heavy on your jobs um, then you're not going to be very happy because you're going to take a long time getting in and out of that uh, this is actually fixed in upstream linux kernel and the 4.16 kernel um, but the rel 7 kernel's implementation is pretty poor uh, since i got a little bit less time than i thought um, let me take some of my favorites so uh, the next one is actually a pretty good one uh, this is Docker losing track of containers in high memory situations. Um, this is what we're, we're running Docker 1.13 because that's the most recent one that's actually been updated on RHEL. Um, what happens here is when Docker gets into really bad memory situations and the node starts swapping to disk um, because you run out of memory, um, then there's a, an issue between the Docker daemon and container D, which is another daemon that does container monitoring. Um, in which they kind of get out of sync. Container D thinks this container is gone. Docker D never really got the message. Docker thinks that the container is still up. Uh, and you kind of lose track of those containers. So from Yarn's perspective, the container is still running. But from the node's perspective, that container is long gone. And so what this ends up doing is this slowly shrinks your cluster over time um, because you just have things that are sticking around that are really done. And they just never free up those resources. Um, I'll skip the next one. That's just a, a, an easy fix. Um, and then the debugging tasks inside of the containers. Um, so this is, along with these, the security components that we have, um, those are really helpful for making bad things not happen. But the problem is then useful things also can't happen. So things sub such as JStacking inside of the container, uh, that's no longer an option of just hopping into the container and running a JStack uh, or doing it outside of the node because JStack actually requires that it knows what the process ID is and the process ID inside of and outside of the container are completely different. Um, so you have to use something uh, such as NS enter to get into that namespace um, while not actually entering the container as you actually would. Um, and then the last one, tasks can't talk to each other through temp anymore. That's great and that's also bad. We really don't want them talking through slash temp as I talked about earlier with the cleanup problem, um, but they do and because they do, that means that uh, if they were, were doing that when you upgrade, they're gonna have problems. Um, so future improvements. We've done a lot of stuff that's been really great, um, but we have some stuff that we still need to do. Uh, first and foremost on our mind is user-specific user layers. This is kind of going back to that whole TensorFlow or Spark or whatever. We want the users to be able to say, I need this library in my Docker image, or I need this library and this library and this library. Uh, but this problem is actually really, really hard um, because of how Docker implements its images. If you say, if in your image you say, I want Python and then I want Perl, and then somebody else comes along and says, okay, I want Perl and then I want Python. Those are two completely different images, even if you said the exact same thing. Um, and because those are two different images, now that you have, you basically have replicated that on disk. Uh, if you have 
tens of different images, or let's say you have hundreds of different users that want different images, uh, that problem just explodes on you. So it actually becomes really pretty difficult, uh, something we're trying to solve currently. Um, another imp improvement that we would really like to get to is something called Podman. This is the horse that Red Hat themselves are backing as a Docker alternative. Uh, it is a CLI compatible Docker replacement, but it doesn't have a daemon. So a problem that we've had in the past is the Docker daemon is a single point of failure. It means that if you are if you're running anything and the Docker daemon needs to get updated, that automatically kills all of your containers unless you have something like Live Restore, which we currently don't because we're running uh, 2.8. Uh, and this is a feature in 3.0 or 3.1. Um, but Podman doesn't have this problem. All of the processes that are running, all the containers are parents of the process that actually init, uh, that forked it as opposed to forking from the daemon itself. And then the last one is Kata containers, um, which is kind of the marriage of Intel's clear containers and Hyper's run V. Uh, this is just very, very lightweight VMs uh, and hypervisor uh, that make, makes it kind of like containers, but it gives you the added protection of it being a VM. Uh, quick view on Docker and Apache. We've, we're on phase two currently. Phase one was Yarn 3611. We had 92 subtests. They're all resolved in one way or another at this point. Phase two is uh, ongoing. It started a month or two ago. Um, it's got 26 sub subtests so far, seven are resolved, uh, and we're making a lot of good progress on that. We have a biweekly meeting of some people in the uh, Docker community, and if you're interested in, um, in hitting up that meeting, it's just a hangout every week on Wednesday at uh, 4 p.m. Central Time. Uh, send me an email, and I will get you added to that list. Uh, and then I'd like to thank um, pretty much everyone that's helped me out on this. You know, I'm still a young guy, not a whole lot of experience in the community, so it's been really nice to having a lot of people help me out, mentor me, and uh, really allow me to, to make my mark on the community, especially in the Docker user space. So thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. All right, maybe one. <clears throat> Anybody got one quick question that they want to ask? or Otherwise, the yarn breakout would be a good time to talk about it. Yeah, Vanu. Uh, hold up, hold up. We need the uh, the microphone or else they're going to yell Not at me. Enough. <laughs> um, did, did you have a lot of scenarios where Docker daemon died and Node, Node Manager and Docker daemon kind of went out of sync, for example? So, okay, so, so uh, basically the Node Manager is still alive, but the Docker daemon is no longer running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, that happened way too many times to count. Um, so it could be either the daemon died or it could be the daemon was never started um, because the Node was brought back through uh, ABFT. Should I use this? Oh, sweet. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the node uh, brought down or whatever. And what happens in this case is actually really, really bad um, because what it ends up doing is the daemon, since it's not running, when it tries to do the Docker run commands, it just fails immediately. It's not the worst thing in the world because it fails the containers immediately, so it's a really fail fast. Um, but it's something that it fails everything that runs. So this has been an upside solution for us. Uh, that's the way we've attacked it. Instead of through Hadoop, we just have monitoring scripts. Uh, we've added some stuff to the NM Health Check script to say, I'm not going to start the node manager unless the Docker daemon is running. And then we just have periodic checks to make sure that it's still running. Okay, thank you.